Golden State Media Concepts bring you Book Review Podcast, a haven for bookworms of all ages and the widest genres from mystery to memoirs, romance to comedy, fantasy to sci-fi. If you love to read, this is a podcast for you. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast. Welcome to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I am your host, Sarah, and I am happy to be with you as always. I hope that you had a great weekend. It was Memorial Day weekend in the States, so if you celebrated, I hope you did something meaningful or fun or meaningful and fun um, to the, all of those who served. This is the day that we remember those who died serving their country, and so we are grateful for that service, but mourn those lives, of course. Um, But hopefully you had a good weekend, regardless of what you did. Our weekend was quiet. Hubby hurt his back somehow, so we didn't do a lot, because he was just trying to rest and stretch his back and get back on the mend. Hopefully he will be feeling better soon. He's he's a little better every day, but it's a slow process. Um, But... You know me, I don't mind a quiet weekend. (laughs) That did not bother me in the slightest. We were going to go to the beach, but decided to just stay home and rest that back. Gave us time to watch silly TV shows, and I, of course, did some reading, and yeah, hung out with the dog. Oh, I gave the dogs a bath and clipped their toenails. They were so mad at me. That was on Sunday, and they did not. Man, they hate having baths. They've gotten a lot better. They just stand there and look at me mournfully. But um, the boy dog still just cannot go through a nail clipping without acting like he is absolutely being murdered. I'm sure our neighbors think I'm murdering him. He yelps. He squirms. And, of course, he makes it worse. So, the, I don't know. I just wish I could figure out a solution. I see those those things where you hang them, you put their little legs in all four holes, and then, like, hang them from a shower rod. Not the dog, the bag. Um, the The dog's in the bag. I feel like he would just squirm his way out of that too, but anyway, this isn't a uh, life hacks for clipping your dog's toenails podcast. It is a book podcast, and we have an author interview, as I mentioned at the end of the last episode. Kelly Z. Riley is here for her third appearance on the podcast, and we are actually talking about two books today, the third and the fourth in her Riches and Royals series. We will be talking about Reluctantly Royal, which is the third book in the series, and Counterfeit Commoner, which is the fourth. As I said, I, you know, I love alliteration, so I like that both of these books have alliterative titles. Let me go ahead and give you the description of Reluctantly Royal, since that is the third and the, the third in the series, the first one that we'll be talking about. Um, Gracie lost her father, her sister's friendship, and her confidence in a single night. Now her academic research in her sister's new home, the Kingdom of Milesia, gives Gracie a second chance. But when she falls in love with the king's brother, she'll have to risk both her heart and her privacy to join him in his world. Oh, and there's just a couple of other little things. She must break a promise, admit to a betrayal, and possibly stand trial for treason. (laughs) Can love conquer all, or will Gracie lose her chance to become reluctantly royal? You know, just possibly stand for trial for treason. No big deal. So this one, as I said, is the third in this series. It is the second involving this particular family. The last book was about Gracie's sister, who's mentioned in that first sentence. Her first sister is Jill, now Queen Jillian, married to King Constantine. So Stefan is Constantine's brother. Gracie is Jillian's sister. We have a romance between the siblings of the characters of the last book. And these are just, they're fun. If you are looking for a good series, there's four now. So if you're looking for a good, fun series that you can read wherever you are. I mean, we always say beach reads, but you don't have to read it on a beach. You can 
read it wherever, but something fun and funny and lighthearted, then, then you should definitely check out this series. Let's go ahead now, though, and reach and turn to the interview with Kelly uh, so she can tell us more about the series and the two books that we're talking about today. Again, those books are Reluctantly Royal and Counterfeit Commoner, and the author is Kelly Z. Riley. Hi, Kelly. I am very happy to have you back to the podcast. Sarah, thank you for having me. It's a delight to be back here. I've always enjoyed our time together. I enjoy talking to you as well. And I'm excited because we're not talking about one book today. We're talking about two books today. Um, before we do the books, though, as usual, if you can start by just sharing a little bit about, about yourself for people who either don't know you or need a refresher. Gladly. So hi, everyone. Welcome to the podcast. My name is Kelly Z. Riley. And if you wonder about the Z, it's because when I started writing, there were two Kelly Riley authors. And although we spelled our names differently, it seemed prudent to differentiate ourselves with something else. I write a um, romance series. Right now, it's my Riches and Royals romance series, where I have romantic billionaires and princes, because they are so much fun to write. I also write a cozy murder mystery series, where I write what I call spies, lies, murder, and cupcakes. And that's a lot of fun to write as well. I've been in the writing business for about 20 years, and I look forward to doing more and meeting more readers as I go. You know, every time you mention the cozy series and then you say the spies, lies, murder, and cupcakes, I, I always, for some reason, focus on the cupcakes. And I'm like, yeah, murder, whatever, but there's cupcakes. <laughs> Well, being married to a professional baker makes it really easy to put the cupcakes in, too. So that's fun. We Ooh. always have to test our recipes. I gain a few pounds with each release on that series. I like it. I Yeah, I I think that's a good good way of doing research. I love doing research. Now, when I did do research on billionaires and princes, unfortunately, that was mostly Internet research and not face-to-face -face research. But not actual billionaires. Yes, if I knew any billionaires, they're cagey about it and don't mention it to me. <laughs> right. Rude. Um, well, that is the series that we are talking about. And there are two books, one that is out and one that will be out this coming week. Um, the day this podcast airs. Is that what you, is that what I heard you say earlier before we started yes. recording? Yes, you did. So um, Reluctantly Royal is out now and Counterfeit Commoner comes out on Tuesday, the 30th of May, which is the date the podcast airs, which makes the podcast especially fun. Yeah, I love that. And these two books, I, I like that it worked out that we're talking about these two books together because they are kind of two sides of the same coin. Um, we have two separate couples, but their stories are intertwined. So do you want to kind of talk about that intertwining of the stories first? Let's start there. One of the things that I like to do as a writer is always challenge myself with new ideas, new settings, new places, new people. And so when I started writing this series, I was fascinated and I and I have always been fascinated about how a person can look like a villain or such in one book, but can be a hero of their own book. And so I wanted to play with that idea and expand it a little bit more. So I wrote this couple of women that look enough alike that they did a um, a switching places sort of thing, which is a classic type of vehicle that a lot of fictional writing does, or fictional entertainment, I should say. And so in so doing, there are a number of pivotal scenes in the books where after having written Reluctantly Royal, they have all of the words and all of the setting in place. And yet I wanted to tell the same scene from a different character's point of view, make their actions seem more motivated and more heroic. So I was locked into a certain vocabulary, and yet I had to do something with the writing magic to twist everything so that you saw the whole scene from a different point of view. That for me was a great deal of fun and a challenge. The first scene in both books actually is the same scene. Uh, it's just told from each main character's point of view. So you get a different understanding of what's happening in that scene both times. Right. And that's the first place where you meet both of the women. Well, you, you've met Sophia, the heroine of Counterfeit Commoner, very, very briefly. You saw her a little bit in um, 
royally scandalized, but you really did not get to know her. And so the first time you get to have any significant interaction with her is in this first scene where the two girls meet and interact together. Mm-hmm. And in, in Reluctantly Royal, she comes off, um, Sophia comes off as very stiff and formal and dismissive and uh, a little witchy, if you will. And I mean that witchy with a B. <laughs> right. Yes. So since Reluctantly Royal came out first, uh, can you just give an overview of that story? Certainly. So this story picks up the the heroine of this story is the younger sister of our heroine from Royally Scandalized. And there's a gap between the two sisters of about eight or nine years. And so they both had their lives shaped by a tragedy when their father died. And both sisters have managed to think that their actions on the night that their father had a tragic car accident were the reason daddy died. And because of that, they started blaming one and blaming themselves and pulling away from each other. So we meet them at a point when their relationship is fractured. And so uh, Gracie, the younger sister, is taking advantage of the fact that her elder sister can now get her into this elite university to do some of the studies that she wants. And she's a, a self-professed brainiac who wants to go on and do marine biology studies. Uh, And she wants that so badly, she's willing to accept her sister's help, even though she feels like she wants to do everything in life on her own without having anyone help her. And so we have her joining the uh, academy in the kingdom to study marine biology, but she insists on doing so under a pseudonym because she doesn't want anyone to think that her sister gave her anything or got her anywhere that she couldn't get on her own. So she has this desperate need to stand up by herself without anyone's help. And so one of the things that she has to learn is how to accept help from people and how to open up and actually become a functioning human being again, because she has locked herself into a world that is only academics and books. And she has almost zero social skills when we first meet her. I remember Sarah, you said uh, I had a lot of work to do because when you saw the first little bit of her in the, the preview that I gave in the prior book, you didn't like her. And so that was interesting to see if I accomplished that task and made her likable or not at the end. You did. And yeah, I do remember that because we don't see enough of her in, in the previous book, it's hard to, it's hard to find things uh, in her character that make her feel relatable. Uh, And so you were able to do that in this book, giving her fleshing out that backstory and giving her more personality and dimension. One one of my favorite reviews that came out from this story was that someone called her endearingly awkward. And Reader actually connected with the fact that this character is very awkward and kind of metaphorically, if not really, tripping over her own feet every time she turns around. Mm-hmm. That, I think, is true for so many of us that find our entertainment and escape in the pages of a book. We yes. would love to be the accomplished heroines we read about, but really we're kind of dorky and awkward and I know when I wrote a couple of scenes with Gracie trying to flirt with with her hero Stefan um it it falls utterly flat and she's thinking to herself well I was flirting wasn't I he didn't react the right way (laughs) and I remember when those skills it's like well I meant it to be funny but I don't think it came off as funny well, and she's also, she's also very young. She's only early twenties. So, you know, none of us are hugely poised at that age unless we come up in a very specific background. Um, whereas the, the heroine in the second and counterfeit commoner has to be more poised, but Gracie was not raised in that situation. So she's, she's young and she's still learning social skills. And she was never the, um, going social person in her high school, for example, and because she was smarter than most, she took advanced classes. And and I think that set some of us on a path where we stay socially young for a lot longer than we are demically young, if you will. Yes. Let's go ahead and take our first break of the podcast. I was just thinking that I didn't say in my intro that we had, we had a, a quite an interesting time getting logged in to do this interview. I 
it was my fault. I don't know what happened with the, with the technology on my end, but I could not hear Kelly to save my life. I rebooted my computer. I, I, I cycled through all of the speakers in when we were trying to record and I could not hear her. Finally, we got it figured out. I'm not 100% sure why it finally worked when I once again cycled through the speakers and found one that actually worked, but, um, it was just crazy. So we started like 45 minutes after our scheduled interview time. If I sound even more discombobulated than usual. I know I always sound a little discombobulated. That's the reason. Um, I was just thinking about that. Kelly, God bless her. It was just very patient and very kind about the whole thing. Um, but, uh, yeah, I just thought I would throw that in there. But we are going to take a break. When we come back, we'll be talking about the inspiration for Reluctantly Royal. Stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I will be right back. Do you want to be healthier, yet you just don't know what to do? All these shows telling you this and that, but nothing seems to work. Well, listen close. Golden State Media Concepts has got something great for you. The health and wellness podcast dedicated to workout trends, healthy eating habits, diet, and everything about healthy living. Join us in our banters as we help you not just live life to the fullest, but live it to the healthiest. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast. I am speaking with returning guest Kelly Z. Riley. We are currently talking about Reluctantly Royal in her Riches and Royals series. This is book three. Let's go ahead and return to that interview with Kelly. And so I always ask the question of what was, you know, what was the initial inspiration for this particular story? Did you go into it knowing that you wanted to give Gracie more of a backstory or was there another a jumping off point for this book? I, I fell in love with the character of Stefan, the one that, that Gracie falls for in this story. When I first introduced him in uh, Reluctant or in Royally Scandalized, because here was this young man who grew up with all sorts of privilege, but had a great sense of humor and charm and was able to put people at ease emotionally originally. And so it, it kind of started with him and, and Gracie had some minor input you saw her very briefly in uh, a scene with Jill's family in the prior book and I thought that they were a perfect couple to put together because they were both smart and they clearly belonged together so one of the most difficult parts of writing this story was finding conflicts to tear them apart because it was so obvious that these two mentally could align well and eventually emotionally as well. And we talked a little bit last time you were here about the kingdom that you've created, the country of Malaysia. We saw a little bit of Malaysia in the last book, but this one takes place almost fully there. So can you talk a little bit more about um, fleshing out some of that world building that you did in the first book? The world building was an enormously fun part of this. It came to me years ago that it would be very fun uh, to set the story in a Caribbean island that had been settled by Greeks. And I'll have to tell you, those two pieces of inspiration, you know, it's funny how creative people can make story out of uh, disparate ideas. One, I had been to uh, the Bahamas, and I had been to the the big hotel on Paradise Island, And as I was there, I thought, oh, wouldn't this be a great setting for a palace in a Caribbean kingdom? And I could transform the casino into a ballroom and I could do this and this and this. And so it put the visual in my mind for what I wanted this country to look like. The other was a colleague I had at the time who was a Greek man uh, who happened to be a very handsome and friendly and charming Greek man, a good friend of our families to this day. But I said, okay, it would be cool to settle the Caribbean island with Greek people. And so that was the impetus for creating this island kingdom where I had exiled Greeks go across the Atlantic and stumble into this Caribbean island and settle and mingle with the natives there and build their kingdom. 
And I, uh, from that point, I had to build out some more conflicts. And I realized that you've got largely light-skinned, whitish Greeks and dark-skinned native islanders, and that there was an ideal source of conflict there. And how did they mold together to form a cohesive society where everyone was valued? And and so one clan, the ruling clan's choice to do more intermarriage and mingle bloodlines and the the their rival's choice to try to stay pure with only royal bloodlines or whatever um, made driving conflict that went ahead in the, the stories. The second fun part was crafting the language. I had previously created a heroine that was gifted with languages and understood the language of this country. And I, I worked hard to come up with a few words of the language that meant like lover or sweetheart or soulmate and that were related. Going into Reluctantly Royal, I only had those handful of words for the country. And yet one of the conflicts I set up is that Gracie, my heroine, is very smart in book knowledge and in scientific knowledge. I gave her this total block about being able to pick up languages because that's where her sister is gifted. And so she sees that as another differentiation point between the two of them. And so when it came to me that I wanted to have Stefan help her learn the language, which became the basis of some really fun and sexy scenes, I knew I needed to have more words for the language. And so I started building out my lexicon and coming up with a number of words for the language and really fleshing it out. I felt very Tolkien-esque, if you will, when I was doing that, because I have this primer of how my language works. And I didn't write any songs in it, but I do have the language. Well, I think you mentioned in your acknowledgments that you have a spreadsheet, which I don't think Tolkien probably had a spreadsheet either. Probably, probably not, but the spreadsheet helped me. In oh, I can fact, imagine. It, it's kind of fun. Throughout this series, you see the retired king and his bride, and I just had the opportunity to write a, a small prequel about their relationship that's going to be coming out in July in an anthology called Romancing the Tropics. And so I had to revisit this and I needed to pull out my spreadsheet. And I laughed when I sent it to my editor because she corrected a, a capitalization error in my own language. And so <laughs> you have to love an editor who can correct you in a language that you made up. Now that's impressive. <laughs> She's impressive. Yeah, I like it. Um, so I think research probably for this book involved. Uh, Gracie is interested in science. She is there to study science. She is um, studying marine biology. So I would assume you did a lot of research in that area. I actually did do a fair amount of research in that area. And I will, I will tell you that in my other life as uh, readers and listeners of the podcast probably know, I'm a scientist in my other life. I'm a PhD chemist. And I caught myself a couple of times geeking out on my own science and putting it in the book, and it had to get ripped out because it was derailing the storyline. So the most fun part of doing the research for the marine biology, I could get a lot online, but I wanted to write a scene that involved a scuba dive. Now, I have tried to scuba multiple times in my life. The minute I get a taste of salt water in my mouth, my asthma kicks in and I start to panic and I have trouble. So I have not to date successfully done a scuba dive. Barely done a snorkel. So I had to do all of the research for this online and from what I knew from doing um underwater. Uh, so we went to Hawaii and we took one of the underwater submarines where we got to see the underwater life and things. So it's, it's like scuba butt staying dry. So I was able to get some animals and research like that. So most of it happened online. But when it came to the scuba scenes themselves, I found someone that was a writer colleague, and I asked them to please read these scenes and catch anything that I had done wrong. And they did come back with a couple of things that went wrong. And it helped me craft what I thought was, uh, again, one of the really fun scenes to write because I wrote a, a scene of Gracie and Stefan doing a scuba dive. And you can imagine if you've got a mouthpiece in your mouth that you're using to breathe, there are no facial expressions involved. There's no verbal anything involved. And so with 
the benefit of speaking or hearing, I had to try to create and craft all the sexual tension that we normally put into scenes. And I was crippled by not being able to use one sense, which made it more challenging, of course. Ah, so yes. So did you set out to, did you just want to write the scuba scene and then that um, eliminating a sense was kind of a byproduct of that? Or did you set out thinking, I want to craft a scene that comes across as a sexy and a little romantic, but having one sense taken away? So I I didn't set out trying to cripple myself and make it harder than I had to. I wanted to do the scuba scene because I wanted to have her be busy doing her studies, but see playful nature in him that she didn't allow herself to see when she was on land with him. And so that uh, is what evolved from there. And I initially had them smiling at one another, and that was the bit that my critique partner pulled out and said, that's not going to happen with a regulator in your mouth. Uh, So the whole uh, bit of sexual tension that I develop involves her seeing a side of him that she finds attractive and approachable, whereas before she's decided he can't be approachable and she's put up all these barriers. Uh, And the fun payoff to that scene as they interact with one another is when she gets flustered and, you know, a flustered young woman who doesn't have a lot of social skills wants to extricate herself from that situation, which she tries to do by going to the surface. And he reaches out and simply touches her on the wrist and points to his dive computer to remind her, if you go up too fast, you're going to have problems. You'll get the bends. There are issues to slow this ascent. But it's that single touch after all the playful interaction, that's the payoff to the romantic scene there. Mm-hmm. I like it. Okay, we are about to segue to the fourth book, the second one that we're talking about today, Counterfeit Commoner. So since we are about to do that, I'm going to go ahead and take a break. Stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I'll be right back. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast and my interview with Kelly Z. Riley. As I mentioned before the break, we are now transitioning to talk about Counterfeit Commoner. Let me give you the description of the book and then we'll go ahead and start talking about it. Oh, and uh, this book comes out today, so that is very exciting. I It's perfect timing that it comes out today and the, inter- the um, episode comes out today as well. So I love it when things... What's the line from the ATM? I love it when a, cl- a plan comes together. It wasn't a plan. It just fell into place, but I still like it. All right. Counterfeit commoner. When she traded her tiara for a few days of freedom, she didn't expect to find herself or to lose her heart to the one man guaranteed to break it. When Lady Sophia de Lyons, former fiancé to a king and protected daughter of the arist- aristocracy, masqueraded as an American commoner, she didn't expect to fall in love. She gets more than she bargained for when the man of her dreams turns out to be the tabloid reporter of her nightmares. Can she ever learn to trust him after he betrays her, or will they both lose everything in a desperate gamble for love? And so this is Sophia and Mike's story. Let's go ahead and let Kelly tell us more about it. 
Now for the second book, Counterfeit Commoner, we've got a different couple and we've got a very different setting. We are no longer in the islands because uh, the main character, Sophie, is trying to get away from that life. So give an overview of Sophie and Mike's story. So Sophia has wanted to run away and live her own life. And when her uncle is imprisoned for treason, she starts imagining ways that that can happen. And Gracie helps her with this. But this is truly a fish out of water story because Sophia has no practical world skills. So I have to work very hard to set her on this journey. And Gracie has helped her craft an escape route. And I used to live in the Chicago suburbs when I wrote this particular escape route. And I actually walked from what was then known as the Sears Tower and is now the Willis Tower walked from there into the train station and looked at what trains go where and picked, of course, the train that went to the town that I was living in at the time so that I could get her out of the city and onto her path. So a lot of the initial research for the plotting involved looking at train schedules and bus schedules and trying to figure out which city she would go in and where. But her journey really starts when she finds, she gets in a cab and she finds the man who left before left his wallet. And as she opens the wallet, some things happen that make her think that fate has decreed she should return it in person. And so that takes her off this prescribed path where she's had her days of adventuring and rode on a train and lived in the quote unquote real world. And now she veers from the script, takes another bus or train, I forget which at the point, and ends up alone and without a lot of money outside a pub in Colorado. And so this was um, this was really a way of getting her into the middle of nowhere. And I'll tell you, the literary reference or the entertainment reference would be a very old movie starring, um, I'm blanking out on her name. Uh, it was called Roman Holiday. So it oh, yeah. involved a very old movie uh, called Roman Holiday where Audrey Princess Hepburn. runs away. Audrey Hepburn, thank you, yes. And the reporter finds her. And helps her, quote unquote, under the guise of getting a story. Another version of that story is called It Happened One Night. Again, but this time it's a socialite, not a princess. But she runs away and ends up again with the reporter who is using her to his own means. And so it was natural for me to pair Sophia with the man who, let's say he used to be the reporter, who created all sorts of havoc in her life and had built his career on innuendo and twisting the truth to make the people in the royal family look bad. And uh, that is Mike. And Mike has his own crisis of conscience or crisis of life because he's he's left the lucrative reporting job behind. Number one, he lost his taste for making fun of the people. And number two, his family has fallen into disarray and he hadn't paid attention. And so he comes home to take over dad's uh, business, which is a, a kind of a gastro pub in the middle of nowhere, Colorado, in a small town in Colorado. That's where Sophia finds herself face to face with this man. And um, she's in her adventure state, wants her first kiss, which she gets from him. Uh, well, unfortunately, she's severely allergic to something that he had eaten not that long ago. And uh, that caused her to pass out. And there starts their story. Now, am I remembering correctly that Mike, using his pen name, of course, is writing articles in the story that involves Jill and Constantine that we talked about the last time you were on? Is he a character in that? Yes. Okay. So did you know then that he was going to play a bigger role or did that, was that just a happy coincidence? What happened was when I realized that Mike in the pen name, Mac the Pen, was becoming pivotal, I actually went back to the earlier stories and I made him much more active in Jill and Constantine's story. Uh, and I amped up his portions. And I also went all the way back to Read My Lips, where the series starts with the Chicago billionaire. And I worked him into there so that there was a more cohesive through line for the stories that involved the writer. And that's uh-huh. the benefit of waiting to release the stories until at least the main portion was written and plotted out and edited so that it was cohesive. 
Okay. Wow. I did not remember that he was in the first book. Nice. Nicely played. He, he was <laughs> very, he was in there and you won't remember it until you go back and say, oh, I know this character now. Yeah. So that, that okay. was kind of fun. Yeah. Um, how about research for this particular story? Anything fun? Uh, well, the setting was a result of a fact that I had taken a trip to Colorado and, um, you know, you flew into the major airport you, and um, started driving to a place that I fondly call the middle of nowhere, Colorado. Now, I have been in the middle of nowhere in a lot of states and a lot of places. And this one middle of nowhere involved me um, running into a person. I was there doing a, a field evaluation for technology that I was working on in my day job. And a group of us had gone to a small pub in the town of Fort Morgan, which was near where we were staying. And a waitress came up to us and said, oh, it must be really nice to travel for a living. It must be fun. I smiled and I said, well, you know, after a while, all airports and hotels start to look the same. She, I will never forget this. She looked at me and she said, I've never been anywhere but here. And it made me realize that there are a whole world of people that don't travel more than maybe 50 or 100 miles from their home, generally, to whom travel seems very exotic. And so I wanted to set a counterfeit commoner in a town where many of the people lived close to home their whole lives. And they had that small town feeling. And, and it's a wonderful family feeling to a town. But there's also this disconnect with the larger world because you haven't stepped outside of it and it seems both frightening and adventurous mm -hmm. and small towns come they can be a character in and of themselves but just the place but also living in a community that's tightly knit and then being the outsider in and the community that i created for morgan's crossing in counterfeit commoner it's so much fun that I would like to set some future books in that community. I, I plan to, as long as I have readers, I would like to continue this series and add more books in that world. And one of the future books will probably take place. I've already got it in my head about um, how another person who's lived the islands most of her life ends up in Fort Morgan and finds some challenging new people and maybe some real love. All right. Okay. So now we've got two places. And actually, that's a good segue because you mentioned the prequel with um, Helena and Alex. Alex. Yes. Okay. Um, what? So we've got a prequel. What else are you working on? Are you working on another book in the series now or just ideas? Well, I have another book in the series that will be coming up. So in, um, in Reluctantly Royal, we meet... Um, Paulo Miklos, who is a confidant and a friend of Stefan. And he is going to be the hero of the next book that I do. Apollo is, oddly enough, a talented economist. He is going to work with one of his friends who uh, wants to take a sabbatical from his teaching job and study economics in other lands, other countries. And so Apollo is going to arrange for him to do some work in the kingdom of Malaysia while Apollo takes over his teaching jobs. So I have the beginnings of that story outlined. I know that he is going to fall for a woman who does the women's studies and literature programs, who feels that she is, um, she she's a very forceful woman who's made her way in her career and definitely made a name for herself, but she's kind of disconnected with her feminine side and isn't sure she cares whether she connects with it or not. So it's going to be kind of fun pairing them up. You'll learn things about this seemingly shallow hero that you didn't expect. And I think that's going to be a very fun addition to the series. What I find fun about the series is that you can read it and you never know what minor character may pop up later. Now we have a, we have Apollo's story and you just never know you put Mac the pen back in as Mike in this one. And so is that something that you think about as you're writing or do sometimes characters kind of surprise you in popping up as main characters for a future book? They tend to pop up as main characters a little bit on their own, but 
early on when I started writing, I wrote heroines or heroes who were kind of only children or alone in the world and didn't have larger communities. And that ended up giving you one book that was hard to tie to something else in a series. And then I took a minute and I said, wait a minute, let's talk about books that I like. One of the series of books I liked was Julia Quinn in her Bridgerton series. And she had been very smart about writing a family that had eight children. And so she could go one after the other through the eight children to build books and stories of each of them and yet kept the family and the other siblings as part of the future books. And it was always for me when I was reading a book and a character from a previous book that I love popped in. And there are a number of other authors that do the same thing, ones that really enjoy reading about. And so I started consciously at that point creating either larger families or communities or the ability to enhance and and make the community larger as I needed. And so uh, if we take Apollo himself, he just sort of popped in as a bit character. I needed someone for Stefan to talk to, and I needed someone to needle him and, and mess with him and push him. And it became the Apollo character. And when I bought it, I thought, you know, this guy is cool enough that he deserves his own book. I knew I had done a reasonably good job of it once when an early critique partner said, oh, yeah, aren't you going to write a book about that handsome guy? And I said, who are you talking about? And in her mind, Apollo had taken on this handsome guy persona that I had not thought that I intentionally wrote. But, you know, readers add layers to the stories that you may not have been aware you put into them. And so that made me think about what his story would be and what his backstory would be, which is even more interesting. Time for our final break of this episode. Stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I'll be right back. Golden State Media Concepts Social Media Podcast. Time to hashtag everything. We talk about all the fun, crazy stories on social media. From Instagram to Facebook, Twitter to Tumblr, or probably even Friendster. Join us each week as we explore the quirky side of social media. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Social Media Podcast. It's simple, it's simple, such a sad song. The one that Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast and the conclusion of my interview with author Kelly Z. Riley. When you wrote the first book, which has two main characters that you make reference to, but they aren't part of the family or part of the royal family, and they're a little more peripheral, did you envision that as a standalone book, but then it became a series, or did you always plan on that being the first book of a series? Well, that's a great question, Sarah, and and. I want to caution my readers, here's a secret look behind the scenes. When I wrote the first book, the book Read My Lips, that was intended to be its own sort of book. And in fact, I wanted the second story to be about the hero's best friend. I became captivated by Jill, the best friend of the heroine, and I wanted to write a story for her. And that's where I said, let's have a prince in the story and let's do this kingdom set in the Caribbean, settled by the Greeks, et cetera, et cetera. And they grew from there. So they were very, very loosely connected in that the heroine's best friend became the heroine of the next book in the series. What happened when I had an editor edit all of these books and I said, I would like my editor to edit all four of the books that I have now together so that they make sense. And really the riches and Royals series, we only have one that's the richest and then it goes into the Royals. And my editor said, you've got a subplot that you should probably pull out. When I pulled out the subplot, I had a hole. And I will tell you one of the hardest things you will ever do as a writer is add a subplot, which I had to do 
and then take it back out again, which I had to do. And I thought this was an ideal way to take Constantine and put him into the book and then tie the the um the billionaire book to the royal books a little bit more tightly by mentioning those characters. So I had to go back and actually craft that so that the whole series would flow together a little bit more cohesively. Makes sense, but sounds hard when <laughs> you know when you when you've already written something and then you have to kind of it, recraft it. It it was incredibly hard and then just for fun, I had my chocolatier and, you know, I, I said, well, what the heck? And I was, I was finishing edits on the most recent murder mystery that I did. And I thought, I'm going to have them just have a talk about chocolate. And I'm going to slip the name of the chocolatier in and have the heroine of that book go, oh, I really love that brand. So I, I created this loose tie to put those two worlds a little bit together. And that's, in programming they call that an easter egg but it's a little funny thing that readers of both series might get and go hey what's going on there and so it's just a little surprise for my loyal readers to see right and make them speculate wait a minute is there going to be a crossover in some way because now the chocolate is in both worlds and i build it so if i want to do a crossover got that opportunity i am very try to plan ahead on things like this. I don't want to lose any opportunity to entertain people and tie worlds together and and build greater and bigger worlds and, and be better at entertaining. So think of the, the spinoff series that if you're in love with a favorite series on TV and then they take a minor character from there or, or something and they spin up a whole new series, you get to see your favorite characters do crossovers and things. It's That's what's in my head when I do that. Fun. Well, if it works out, that will be really fun. And if not, you can still always throw in possible Easter eggs. Right. Yes. They're fun to do. I would imagine. Yeah. Um, And, it, you know, it kind of keeps your mind in both worlds or it, it helps you. I, I would imagine as, you know, writing is so solitary that making things more fun, more creative for you also is kind of in, engaging or um just fun. And you've actually, we, we've hit on two or three things that I've said, hey, I gave myself this challenge to see if I could pull it off. And I had a lot of fun with it. And the readers don't necessarily see that challenge behind, but they get to enjoy the story. I'm constantly trying to make myself grow as a writer and get more skilled and, and do things that put me out on a limb and make me write myself back to a safe space. So it does keep my mind more engaged and I have to have that or I will get bored. Yeah, I would imagine. Well, how about on the flip side of writing, reading? Have you been reading anything fun just for your own personal reading lately? Oh, I have been doing um, a fair amount of reading. I, I found a new author. Her name was Meg Frampton. I I tend to enjoy reading historical romance. I like that greater than life feeling. It's not the area I write in, and so I'm less picky about writing skills, and it sort of takes me away. Although, on the other hand, I've I've told different uh, readers or potential readers that you can think of my books as historical fiction, but with modern plumbing, because I tried to bring all those those grandiose ideas forward in time. Uh, but anyway, I've been enjoying the Meg Frampton series. That's a great deal of fun. I'm now about to get into some some scholarly series about, um, of all things, about ancient Hebrew and, and biblical language and interpretation. And, and um, I'm going to go geek out on something else so that when I write the next mystery and the next romance, I don't have a mystery or a romance voice in my head. I can clearly go with my imagination and make the stories work. I'm terrified of reading fiction while I write fiction. So I've got to go to something nonfiction that's interesting to me. Well, yeah, you got to do, you got to do what works as long as it's, um, as long as it's what you want, you know, um, geez, I cannot talk today. <laughs> as long as it is enjoyable for you and, you know, relaxing your brain in a way that is helpful. I do, uh, I find that for me, I can live in one fictional world at a time. 
And that's either the world I'm writing or the world I'm reading if I'm going to do well and keep my production schedule up. It's Mm -hmm. bled over into the fact that I can't watch long-term TV series about the topic that I'm writing about. So when I write mysteries, I will probably let my um, my recording device, my DVR, record all of the murder, mystery, police dramas that I normally watch. And I'll say, I will deal with that later. I will binge on it later. But right now I'm writing so that it doesn't, you know, lead over into the two worlds. So I'm going to have to get into nonfiction for a while. All right. Well, thank you. Um, I always ask you this question so people can find you if they would like, but, um, website and any social media that you're active on. The website is www.kelly, that's K-E-L-L-E, Z Riley, R-I-L-E-Y dot net. And the dot net is, um, is the part that's tricky. You can also find me on Facebook at, at facebook.com slash Kelly Z Riley. If you don't use the Z, you end up in my personal page. And if I know you, I'll be your friend. And if I'm not sure about you, uh, find me through Kelly Z Riley first. Um, my Amazon author page is Kelly Z Riley. Uh, I'm also active on Goodreads and BookBub. And you'll find all of the links to Twitter and Amazon and uh, YouTube. I have some fun, fun videos on YouTube about research that I've done for the books. So you can find all of those links through my website. Perfect. Thank you. Kelly, is there anything that we haven't covered in our time together that you would like to highlight? I would like to invite all of your listeners and those who are interested to sign up for my newsletter with the caveat that I am switching newsletter providers, so there may be a couple of hiccups along the way. But please do sign up because I'm working on some projects to bring out large print and hardcover editions of my books, as well as audiobooks. I've had a lot of people ask about audio. I've had a lot of people ask about large print. And I will announce that through my newsletter when the time comes. So if you're interested in those things, please do sign up. I promise not to inundate you with information, and I'll try to keep it short and pertinent. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And thank you for joining me again to talk about the newest books in this series. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you for hosting me, and I can't wait until I write something new so we can get together again. It's always a pleasure to talk with you and to reach out to your listeners. Sounds wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much to Kelly once again for coming back for a third time to talk about this series and for putting up with all of the crazy mishaps in terms of getting logged in. I'm very grateful that she was patient with me and um, very kind. And I always have, I always enjoy having her on and hearing her ideas and her excitement for writing and her enthusiasm for the characters in her books and the connections made between those characters and, you know, potential crossover between a cozy mystery and her romantic series. I think that would be awesome. But you never just, you just never know what might happen. So if you're a fan of romance, if you're um, looking for something maybe lighthearted and fun to read on any upcoming vacation you have this summer, or you're just looking for a good read and you like series, and these can be read as standalones or you can read them in order, but there are four out. As of today, there are four books out, and there is that prequel coming, but four books is a is really good, you know? You can take four books on your e-reader or in person, in person, huh, hard copies, you know what I mean, um, on your vacation with you, and you will have plenty of romance and um, humor and just lighthearted reading, whether that's reading at home or reading on vacation. Up to you. At any rate, thank you to Kelly. Thank you for you to you for joining me, as always. I hope that you will join me on the next episode. I will be interviewing author DC Gomez about the second book in her or The Order's Assassin series. This one is called The Traitor. Uh, if you're familiar with that series, and you'll definitely want to join me for that. If you are new to that series, as I am, then you'll, again, definitely want to join me and learn more about the series. Um, so we've got witches, demons, and shifters. We are turning back to fantasy, but 
looking forward to meeting DC and hearing more about this series. As always, if you are a fan of this podcast and you have a few minutes and the inclination to help get this podcast out to more people, you can like, follow, subscribe, whatever, on the platform that you listen to the podcast on. That way you'll always know when there are new episodes. You can also leave a review, uh, written or starred, really either way helps to get it out to more people. Whatever your platform allows you to do, written or starred, um, I appreciate it. It can be a one-sentence review. It doesn't have to be anything elaborate, but it does get this podcast to more listeners. And then finally, if you're on social media and would like to follow the podcast there, you can do so at Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. Love hearing from you. Hope you're having a great week. I hope you had a good weekend, but... um, Whatever's going on in your life, uh, my, my ultimate hope is always that you have plenty of time to get yourself lost in a million different good books. Thank you so much. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast, part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network from movies to music, from sports, to entertainment, and even weird news. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's program.